Ralph, does your hand shake for the rest of the day? Wait, wait. <laughs> Would you do that? Good morning. Welcome to worship. This is a great day uh, to worship the Lord and to celebrate the fact that he is alive. He is risen uh, just as he said he would be. God speaks to us in a variety of ways. He speaks to us through music. He speaks to us just in the beauty of creation. He speaks to us, though, in silence as well. In fact, some of the most profound things he says, he says through silence. Um, it is a commodity that our culture tries to stamp out. <laughs> but the fact is, God has a lot to say to us, a lot of important things to say. And sometimes he needs silence to do that. So as we prepare for worship today, to enter into worship together, let's, um, let's just take a moment of silence and ask the Lord, is there anything that you'd like to say to me as we begin uh, worship together? Holy Spirit, you are here in this place, but we want you to know you are welcome here to speak however you choose through the music, through the prayer, through the word, your word, and through the silence. We give you our attention today and we honor and praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, God is our creator, and we are made in his image, and we are made to worship him. And so we're going to join our voices together now in doing that through song. So I invite you to take out your hymnals. That's the red book that you can find underneath of the seat in front of you. Go ahead and pull out the black notebook while you're down there. Save yourself some knee bends later on. Um, but we'll begin in the hymnal number 58. This is my father's world, number 58. If you're able, would you stand with me as we worship the Lord together in song this morning? This is my father's world, and to my list he gives, all issues, themes, and family rings have you. Oh, to be like the number 387. Oh, 
if you'd switch books, um, take out the black notebook, section B, number 24. I cannot tell is the name of the song. Section B, 24. That song reminds us there is just so much that uh, you and I, we don't know. Uh, we don't understand about ourselves, about God, and about our world. Uh, but as followers of Jesus gathered here today, we do know this, that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again to make possible the beauty of forgiveness and redemption for all who will turn from lives of sin and choose to trust and to follow him. And no matter what happens here between people and between nations, we have a sure eternity with God our Father, the one who created us. To know that and to experience it is all the reason we need to celebrate and to give thanks to God today. Uh, so we've come to do that. That is what corporate worship is about. But as we do that, we also wanna pray for the needs of those we love those who are walking through difficult days with sickness, you know who they are. Uh, would you pray for them, lift them to the Lord? Those who are getting ready to graduate and to change chapters in life. Uh, over these next weeks, there'll be a number of people in that circumstance. Pray for them. Those in situations of poverty, both near and far away around the world, let's pray for them. And those in places of war today, Ukraine and, and Israel on a greater level come quickly to mind, but there are others 
Uh, let's pray for them, including our own military, who is defending many people around the world in these days. If you have a burden that you'd like to lay before the Lord that's, that's on your heart today, or maybe if you have something you'd like to particularly give him thanks for, you know you're welcome to come and pray at this altar. Uh, it's a place of prayer, and it is open to all who would come. Our, our uh, call to prayer is a chorus of lavish love, abundant beauty. If you need the words, it's printed there in your worship guide. Let's sing and, and prepare our hearts to pray. And again, if you'd like to pray at the altar, come on up while we sing, and then we'll go to prayer together. As I lead us, would you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, we gather here today joining our voices with all the great choirs of angels and saints of all times and places to sing to you, to sing of you, to sing of your majesty and your mercy, of your power and your love the love that made salvation possible for we who are so unworthy, for worms like us, that's how Isaac Watts put it. And yet your love for us overcame. And so we're able to claim you as our God. And without fear, we're able to stand before you and give to you all glory and honor and praise. Together, we confess. And more than that, Lord, together we proclaim to all who will hear that you are the one and only holy God, gracious creator, and good, good father. We're so grateful to be your sons and daughters. We're grateful to be adopted into your family at this tremendous cost of Jesus' great suffering. And that's why we exalt him. We exalt Jesus as the very God of very God, one with you, heavenly father, begotten of you, born of a virgin, abused and beaten by a sinful generation, but blessed by your hand to be raised to life again, and so is now the firstborn of the dead. And he leads the way for all who have known abuse, all who have known suffering, all who have known hardship in life. He leads the way from defeat and death to victory and to life. And so we greatly follow Jesus, Father, to your very side. God, we thank you for walking these days with us through your spirit. You lead, you teach, you heal, you help and empower and correct us so we can really, truly become the people you intend us to be. And so we can show the broken world around us your reality and your mercy and your overcoming power. Lord, as we pray for ourselves and the faithfulness of our own witness, we pray for those who hurt around us. We pray for whole nations in turmoil today, those in war and those on war's brink. We pray for people suffering because of the hatred of others toward them. We pray for cities and communities who suffer violence and crime and all the other blights that sin brings. We pray for families and persons who struggle with conflicts and hardships sicknesses and griefs that are now a part of this world, but that you never intended to be. Lord, in all of these, would you show us even more mercy 
And as you do, would you remind us that you are working, even now, to restore your creation. In Jesus, your kingdom has come. And in your spirit, there is power for your will to be done here, just as it is in heaven. You've started the process of bringing order to this chaos and healing to sick and peace to all who will say yes to you. So, Father, in all we see, in all that we suffer, above all else, would you help us to say an unwavering yes to you so we might participate fully in all the grace that you have to give, all the healing that you want to do, all the redemption that you offer. Lord, we bow before you and we give you our allegiance and our trust. And we are blessed to be able to do it, Father, because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Tanya Bryant, and I have the privilege of reading our scripture today. We will be reading Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6, which can be found in the Pew Bible on page 404. Again, that is Psalm 50, and in that Pew Bible, it's going to be page 404. If you are able, would you please join me by standing as we read God's word. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice and the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. The word of God for the people of God. Children, this is your time. I invite you to join me up here in the corner if you would, please. I hope you had a good week. It was a wet and rainy week, wasn't it? Did any of you happen to see an old guy, a really old guy, building a boat anywhere? (laughs) You didn't? Well, you know, with all the rain that we had, yesterday was an absolutely beautiful day. Did you get out to enjoy the day? The sky was so blue. The sun wasn't too hot. It felt just right. Gentle breeze was blowing. Birds were chirping. Squirrels are running. You can smell the fresh cut grass. You ever smell fresh cut grass? It smells so good, especially when the neighbor's the one that cut it. Yeah. <laughs> and you get to hear the neighbors talking and chattering. God has made the world so wonderful and beautiful, hasn't he? You ever think about a leaf and wonder about that? These are leaves but they're all different leaves. They're different from each one. None of them are the same. They're from different plants. Look at all the veins and lines in the back of that. This one has some color in it. How does does God put something inside that makes one leaf like this, shaped like this, and another like that? Then this one has color. Do you ever wonder how all that stuff happens? Think about What all is inside of those little lines going up through the leaf? What's that like? And that's just leaves that make us wonder. But then there's so much other beautiful stuff that God has made. You ever see a horse running with a storm in the background? Isn't Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Amazing picture there. What about the sunset and sunrises? You ever watch, go watch the sunset? Watch the sunrise. You can see great sunrises over here. Go to Asbury University. You can see wonderful sunsets there. Just so beautiful. And there's another leaf of a different sort. 
And look what God did there. He made a bee to go sit on it. And if you look close, you can see the pollen on the side of the bee that he's getting out of that flower. And then this wonderful waterfall. So beautiful, isn't it? Wouldn't you love to just sit there and listen to the water falling down? You'd like to jump off of it. That would be fun too. Yeah. If you can swim, yeah, that would be fun, wouldn't it? That is, that's just a little bit of the beauty that God has created in the world. But he has made something that is more beautiful and more wonderful than all of that. And I have a picture of it here. Guess, can you guess what's in this picture? Huh? It's me? <laughs> Look real close, okay? I want you to see it. Can you see what's in there? Us. You. You are the most beautiful and wonderful thing God has created. You know why? Because you are an image bearer of God. He has made you and I in his image. You are the most beautiful and wonderful thing he has ever created. Each of us are. Jesus, I thank you for the beauty that you have put into each of these children and the wonder of how they are made in your image and the wonder of what purpose you have for them. Would you fulfill that wonder into a reality into each of them and in this world. And may they continue and always be an appropriately proud bearer of your image and share your presence with the rest of the world. In your name, amen. You may go to children's worship if you're age four through third grade. If you would, take a moment to fill out this white welcome card that you can find in your worship folder. If you're visiting with us for the first time and looking for a church home, we would love for you to fill that out. And instead of dropping it in the offering boxes, take it to the Welcome Center out in the foyer after service. There are many things coming up in the next weeks and months to take a look at in your worship folder. Um, the, you may have noticed some palm trees sprouting in the foyer. Um, that did not happen naturally, but they look really good. Um, we are collecting different supplies for VBS, so if you would like to um, donate things for decorations or crafts or snacks, there will be things up there to take a look at, and as things come down, more will go back up, a variety of price ranges. So if you want to take a look at that, we would greatly appreciate your help. Another way you can give is on Saturday, April 27th, the uh, quiz team is selling hanging ferns. Um, info about that is in the worship folder. This weekend coming up, there is a work retreat at Eagle Ridge. That is our conference's campground. If you um, are interested in going and you've been there and you love it there and you've got a heart to work, there is something you can do. If you've never been out there, this would also be a great opportunity to go and see the grounds and contribute whatever you can to helping um, fix some things up and just make it even more beautiful and usable for all those who get to enjoy that space. Um, there is information in the worship folder also about concerts um, and men's breakfast coming up on Saturday, April 20th. I was ill-prepared. <laughs> the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian believers that no one should give to the Lord reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves cheerful givers. That is true no matter what it is we're giving to God, our talents or worship or time. But Paul was speaking there specifically of our money. A mature Christian is one who has learned to give with gratitude and expectation and even excitement about how God will use those gifts.
beautiful, ladies. Thank you very much. We are all artists. Every one of us are potential creators of beauty. Now, you may not believe that. You may say, ha, I couldn't art my way out of a paper bag. But that is just not so. Simply by being human, by sharing God's image, we are all artists. Over the next few weeks, my goal is to help us believe that while working through an apologetic, a case for both the divine nature and the practical importance of beauty in our lives. And of the fact that beauty exists in our world, not incidentally or accidentally, but very much on purpose. God intentionally chose to create and to fill his creation with beauty. For beauty's own sake, for our pleasure, amazingly, and for his glory. And that reason alone makes the appreciation of beauty and the pursuit of beauty and the study of beauty worthwhile to us. Now, please understand that we're not talking here about vanity. Vanity and beauty are not the same. Vanity is this human preoccupation with and pride in ourselves and our own appearance. When everything we're about revolves around getting other people to notice us and to look at us, that's vanity. That's actually self-worship. And it's alive and well in our world today, and especially so on social media. I'm not talking about vanity. I'm talking about noticing, studying, and appreciating beauty wherever we experience it, simply because beauty is a reflection of God. That's enough of a reason to notice, study, and appreciate it. But here's another reason to do it. The Christ follower's engagement with beauty offers a way to communicate missionally, redemptively, with a huge chunk of our culture today who do not yet believe that God is the ultimate originator of the beauty and the art that they themselves make and that they appreciate. Just like the many in our world who appreciate the logic of God but reject God as the great logician. Or the many of our world who love and admire and frankly all but worship the natural creation yet reject God as the creator. Just like them, God is also the greatest of artists that tragically the vast majority of today's artists neglect at best and overtly dismiss at worst, and especially so in our society and in the global West, especially so here. Art, in all of its different forms, has become remarkably lopsidedly secular. And yet it's God's very creativity and beauty that all artists pursue and want to emulate. It's ironic, isn't it? Here's something even more ironic. A great many Christians tend to minimize the concept and value of art. And if you question that, consider which are the first programs to get their budget slashed when schools, Christian schools, fall on hard financial times. And what are the first extracurricular activities to be dropped when Christian families face money problems? And yet those same faithful people bow down in worship of the God whose greatest act was, if not the creation of our world in beauty, then certainly the recreation of its beauty that he has underway even today through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. 
You see, we who love God and follow Jesus, if we appreciate God, then we are appreciators of art and beauty, whether or not we realize it and whether or not we want to be. Beauty is a part of us simply because we are of God. And the making of beauty, the creating of beauty that is a part of us, that is at its source a part of him, a part of God. You and I, whenever we create or we recreate so that something that was somehow damaged is now made whole again, we are contributing to the art of making or remaking beauty in our world. And that is the very work of God. That's what God does. He brings beauty into being. In fact, I would even suggest that's all he does. From the creation event onward, God brings beauty to be. He brings light into darkness. He brings order to places that are chaotic. He brings knowledge where there's ignorance. He brings vibrance where things are gray. He brings clarity where things are fuzzy. He brings wisdom where there's confusion. He brings production where there's desolation. In all of these ways and hundreds more, what God is really doing is he's bringing himself to where there is need of him. Bringing beauty to damaged, compromised, ugly places. He gives beauty in place of ashes. That's how the prophet Isaiah put it. To those of God's people who mourn, he writes, God will give beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of heaviness. You see, the most basic element of what God is about is that of the artist to bring beauty. Why? Why is that what God is about? I would suggest for at least these two reasons. I'm sure there's more, but at least these two reasons. The first is because God is beauty. Now, please hear me carefully. Beauty is not God. In spite of what some of today's cosmetic surgeons may claim, beauty is not God. We do not worship beauty, but God is beauty. There are, are three cosmic values that philosophers through the ages have called the transcendentals. Uh, those things which exist beyond the world of time and space and matter. Truth, that which defines reality. Goodness, that which fulfills its purpose. And beauty, that which is lovely. The Greek thinkers of the classical age believed the world had genuine meaning and purpose. And so the transcendentals they thought were objective in nature. They were knowable to us. That's what that means. Since we humans and no other creature have three corresponding internal capacities. They said reason, morality, and emotion. So when those three human internal capacities of reason, morality, and emotion correspond correctly with the three transcendentals, we become fulfilled persons. Our purpose and meaning aligns with that of the cosmos. That's how they thought. By about the 5th century AD, the Mediterranean world had been largely converted to Christianity, which allowed Christian civilization to dominate the Western world and, and a good part of the East for nearly a thousand years. And during that time, those Christian philosophers and theologians appropriated the truth of these cosmic values as truths of general revelation grounded in the nature of God. So God doesn't simply have some bit of truth, goodness, and beauty. They said, no, God is truth, and God is goodness, and God is beauty. Or to, to say it another way, all truth is God's truth. All goodness is God's goodness, and all beauty is God's beauty. Christian philosopher of our day, Peter Crave, says that since God is the creator of all, everything that exists is in some way true, good, and beautiful. 
including, of course, us. We are not only made by God, but we are made in his own image, which is why we human beings innately long for truth, goodness, and beauty. We pursue these whether we realize it consciously or not. And when we do, again, whether we realize it or not, we are actually pursuing God. We are looking for their beginning, we're looking for their source, and we're looking for their ultimate fulfillment. That's why there are always more books to be written. And that's why there's always more justice to be served, and more mercy to be offered, and more art, more beauty to be made, you see. Even with all that has already been produced by humanity back through the ages, All of that put together has not yet captured and revealed in completeness the ultimate truth, goodness, and beauty of God. We won't know that until we are with God face to face. But still, we keep driving toward it. Humanity does. And we catch parts of it. With every painting we paint, with every song we compose, with every book or poem or sermon we write, with every crop that we bring out of the ground, with every house or table or car or dress or arrangement or whatever else that we create, we are participating in the very beauty of God. The creating of beauty, it's part of the human nature and drive because we are of God and that is what God does. Creating beauty is the most basic element of what he does. The first reason God brings beauty is simply because that is who he is. But the second reason that God, by his nature, brings beauty is because he is love. And out of his love flows this relentless desire for his world, broken as it's become, this relentless desire for it to be made whole again. It's a power that we cannot fully understand. It was in love that he created it in beauty. And in love, he is making it beautiful again. Because you see, no one who loves wants his or her beloved to know and suffer chaos and turmoil and ugliness. No parent wants that for their child. So just as God originally created beauty in love, he is now all about recreating beauty again in love. That's why Paul writes, the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. You see, even the creation knows that it was made beautiful. It was made good, very good, in fact. And even though its beauty is now compromised because of human sin, somehow it knows that God will restore its beauty through human redemption. Even the creation knows what beauty is and where it's from. That's why Jesus said, you know, back on Palm Sunday, that as his appearance, even the stones would have cried out, if his disciples had been forced to silence, because even the stones knew that the beauty of recreation and redemption was on its way. Somehow, even they knew. Love always seeks beauty. And God's love, as all-powerful and overwhelming as it is, will, without doubt, bring beauty in the end. Romans 8, 28, for we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him. It's inevitable. Overwhelming love cannot help but bring beauty. And so this appeal to beauty and art and their source and their cause over against trying to convince with debate or argument and all of that, the appeal to beauty may well be the better way to reach our world with the message of who God is and what he's about and what he has done in Jesus. 
When we give ourselves to bringing, to offering beauty to a world that searches for it, but is surrounded by ashes and pain and desolation, when Christ followers bring in love beauty to them, we are bringing God to them. We are meeting a deep gut level need in their life while showing them who God really is and what he's about. And you know, often that happens, and at least initially, without saying any word at all. Not a word. Tom Wright says that in our making an offering of beauty to our world, we're something like the spies that Moses sent into Canaan who brought back the fruit of God's land to those who are still living in the desert so they could see and believe the future God wants for them. Beauty announces to our world that God is about redemption, about restoring loveliness where it's been crushed. He'll do so in the life of anyone who will. He'll do that for anyone who will receive it from him. And so that's why he calls his church. He calls us. We who know, we who follow Jesus, he calls us to paint that picture of possibility so those around us can see it. That's the work of the artists. And we are those artists. We are the artists. There's an interesting thing about this Psalm 50 that Tanya read for us. Um, it's not just declaring uh, that God is perfect in beauty, shining forth in Zion, there in verse 2. Uh, there's plenty of Bible passages that speak of God's beauty. What's intriguing about this one in particular is that unlike most of the Psalms, this is uh, definitely a courtroom setting. The, the picture it paints here is of a courtroom. And God acts in this little vignette, as he always does, in two capacities. Here, he's both the judge and the prosecutor. And his people Israel are the defendants that he is calling before himself. This is not, though, a, a last judgment kind of thing. Or, or what we might think of today as a final sentencing. This is not that. This is, you might say, a preliminary hearing that God is convening here. And he's charging his people with false worship and sinful lifestyles. God's people had failed to reflect his beauty to their world. The art that they were making in both their worship together and in their individual lives, that art did not point to God and to his beauty. It was not honest. It was not felt of the heart, and so it was not redemptive. In fact, it was all rote, thoughtless, pretentious. And in a word, it was self-serving. What Israel was about and what they were doing. There was no love for God and there was no love for others behind anything they did. So they painted and they sang and they wrote and they created, but all for their own self-interest all for their own benefit. Yet all the while, they, as Israel, as God's people, they were suggesting to their world that what they did was of God. So God here is very graciously, but very sternly, letting them know it was not. It was not of him. And it was not okay that they keep on. The beauty they were making, he says, was no beauty at all because it lacked love as its motivation and it lacked God as its goal. So they were presenting to their world ashes instead of beauty. And the God who is beauty and love wanted them to know that he will not long suffer that sort of behavior from anyone, but especially from people who say they belong to him. You know, God has given us so many riches, including the talents he's designed for us to use to create beauty that speaks of him and that points to him. Simply because we are made in his image, we are all artists of some sort. The question is, 
the question that Israel had to face and the question that the church has to answer is are we making beauty with our lives that speaks of God to our world? Is the art of our lives being created and offered in love for God and in love for those God loves? Will you give your art to bring light into darkness and order to chaos? Will you in love bring knowledge where there's ignorance and vibrance where things are gray and production where there's desolation? Will you in love bring clarity to where things are dull and wisdom to where there is confusion? Will you work with God and will you let him work through you to bring beauty, to bring himself to where there's need of him. That's the life of the artist made in God's image. And that's the life he calls his people to live. Lord, would you help us to see the art that we make? Really, you want it to be a reflection of you that we can be powerful witnesses for you simply through bringing your beauty to bear in our world. Would you help us to do that faithfully, to not fall into the traps like Israel did of self-worship and self-service? Lord, show us the artist in all of us that you're calling us to be and help us to walk with you and respond to you in just that way. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Our song of response is number 465 in your hymnals. It's called In His Time. He makes all things beautiful in his time. Number 465. If you're able, would you stand with me as we sing these words together? Tonight at uh, six o'clock, we have we'll have we'll share some testimonies uh, of God's mercy in our lives. The sanctuary choir is singing in the evening worship service, and Andrea Tinsley will be here to bring us an update on her ministry in South America and what she is uh, where she is heading in her life today. So I invite you to to come back and close the Lord's day in worship. Um, Makoto Fujimura is a, a Christian artist. He writes. He says, the art of God and his people is one that fills in the cracks and fissures of broken, splintered lives, allowing a golden light to shine through that even if only for a moment, reminds of the abundance of the world that God created and that God is even now recreating. We have this tremendous invitation to participate with God in making beauty and so bring, bringing him, his love and his hope to our dark world, filling in the cracks and the fissures 
so people can see the completeness of God. We're called to do that. The Spirit will empower us to do that. Let's do that with his blessing. Thanks for coming to worship today. The Lord bless and keep you. Thank you.